let's get to Marcia. Marcia, uh, you are a hard woman to describe. I have a bio here on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you are so cool. And I, I mean, right. I can't even read all this, but I will say Marcia is the director of the transactional skills uh, program at the University of Miami School of Law, which is very cool uh, because it's practical. Marcia has a practical background, but is also in academia. And so you get this cool mix of looking big picture, but also getting down into it. So we're going to leave the time to Marcia to talk about this function of looking for AI risks. I know you guys are all being asked the question, what's our risk? Who knows? So Marcia is going to let us know how we can hide and seek those risks. Marcia, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Feel free to uh, share your slides and uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, in the interim. Okay. So also, let me, let me set the expectations. You guys may ask a bunch of questions that I cannot answer uh, because everything in this area is in so much flux. But I will commit that if you put the questions in the chat that I can't answer, Mike and Law Inside will keep them, and I will commit to getting the best answer I can to you by Monday. So if there's, if you have a question, maybe 40 people thumbs up it, and I don't answer it, it's because I don't know the answer to the question. It's not because I'm snubbing you and saying, I'm going to go to that one question that only one person put a thumbs up to. So that will be one thing. Um, and things are changing. So if you're watching this live, this is all current as of 1.03. Uh, things change by the minute, though. So even though you're going to get the slides, I'm not saying, you know, don't rely on them. I'm just saying, you know, be careful. Okay. So everybody can see my slides right now. We're all good. Whoops. Let's try this again. I no, couldn't for a second there. Dude, yeah. the tease. That was the tease. That was very effective. <laughs> was tease. Here's the tease. All right. So this is contract audit AI edition. What are we going to be focusing on? It's important to know that we're going to talk about a very high level overview of generative AI. Not because I think you don't know what it is, but because some of you are, you know, might even be app developers. And some of you say, I'm just on this because I think I need to know what this is about. So we're going to do a very high level. And part of the reason we're going to go through some vocabulary terms, right? And this is not a whole session on what is generative AI. But if you don't know what some of the terms mean, when you look at the contracts, and I'm going to request that you all look at your contracts and look at the terms, there may have very specific meanings depending on what that vocabulary is, right? So it's almost like the defined terms in any kind of contract. Second, we're gonna talk about the legal risks you need to be aware <clears throat> to serve your clients, and then what the questions you need to ask. And excuse me because <clears throat> my voice isn't as good as it should be today. So when I talk about what questions you need to ask, there are probably hundreds of questions in this PowerPoint. You will get the slides. Please don't feel like you've got to furiously scribble because you will get them all, all right? So let's talk about what we're not gonna discuss. Um, and this is a shameless plug for two Law Insider uh, webinars that I did not do, but which are excellent. And what I want you to know is we're not gonna talk about how we're gonna use AI to streamline the contracting process. So hopefully you guys don't all drop off because it was a really good uh, session that was done in June. And I've actually put the picture up there. We're also not going to talk about what kind of clauses to use. I'm going to tell you what language to look for, but not how to draft the clause. Um, and there was a great webinar that was done just last month or two months ago on data terms. And we're not going to talk about the nuances of the various laws. Why? So I may mention GDPR, but this is not going to be a webinar about GDPR. You should know what that is, but we're not going to talk about those. So there's a lot of things that we won't talk about in detail, but that you'll have resources to go to. So first, let's think about why is this important? So I'm not sure how many of your in-house and outside counsel, maybe you can put that in the chat, whether you're in-house or outside counsel, that would be helpful to know. But if you're in-house, you know, and I'm also the general counsel of a startup that deals with, with some of these issues, AI issues and other kinds of things. So I still do practice law, I'm not just in academia, right? And I'm a former deputy general counsel, chief privacy officer, chief compliance officer. So if you're in-house, I feel your pain and your joy and your challenges. And you know that you're the lawyer, but you're also a business advisor. You might have to sell. You deal with the corporate communications. Whether you want it or we are not, you might become the employment law person. You sometimes become the privacy person. You're the trainer. But the most important role you have is as the risk manager. Because contracts, all that is, is trying to figure out how am I going to allocate, minimize, transfer, reduce, or accept the risk. So when we think about artificial intelligence, this risk manager role becomes even more exponentially important. Let's do a little bit of vocabulary so we can get on the same page. And I try to dumb this down without making anyone feel dumb. 
So first term, machine learning. And you may have heard about this. Why do I have a lot of cats? I like cats. A lot of people don't like cats. But think about if you showed a computer thousands of images of cats, it would start to figure out without you telling it it's a cat, there's a cat in this picture. So the machine learning is basically teaching the computer to learn from lots of experience. Large language model, right? This is a super smart computer program. It can write the essay, it can summarize your stories, but it needs the data to train them. So you'll hear me talk about training the large language model or training the AI. It gets all of this data from all over the internet. It scrapes the data from the internet and that leads to some of the intellectual property issues we'll talk about in a little while. But you'll hear people talk about a large language model. You may also hear people talk about, <laughs> excuse me, a small language model, and that's more closed. Sorry, Mike. <clears throat> uh, just a reminder, as Marcia is catching her breath, if uh, <laughs> if all of you could, uh, just as a reminder, use the chat to talk to each other, use the Q&A, make sure as questions get added to the Q&A that you're using a thumb up just so that we know which questions are most important to you. Go ahead, Marcy. Okay, so this I actually asked ChatGPT, what is generative AI? And this is what it gave me because there's no presentation you can do that doesn't ask ChatGPT a question. Now I'm gonna switch to water instead of tea. Excuse me, sorry about this. So when you think about generative AI, this is where the machine is now using the machine learning and is able to generate text images that did not exist before. So when you think about your chatbots, your image generation, your content creation tools, um, that's what we're talking about. And now we're gonna come up, I believe, well, almost our first poll, but the last thing is artificial generative intelligence. This is what people are worried about, that at some point the robots are gonna take over and they're gonna surpass human thinking. Depending on who you are, if you're Elon Musk, you think this is about three years away. If you're some other futurist, you think this is seven to 10 years away. And some people think it's 50 years away. What does that mean for us as lawyers? We need to be thinking about this like it can happen now because lawyers are the last people. We're always the lagging indicator to get involved. And we need to be involved in shaping the laws and the policies that deal with this. What's open AI? You may have heard of open AI if you're using chat DPT, but open AI is a lot more than chat DPT. There are 100 million weekly users. It is the largest selling consumer product basically of all time. And there are 2 million developers. So when we think about open AI, we think about chat DPT, it's much more than that. The so open AI actually provides these kinds of services to lots of other companies. So the reason that's important is when you're looking at your contracts, you might, I'm gonna talk about open AI and chat GPT, but open AI could be involved in many, many other things that are not chat GPT. And according to Sam Altman, 92% of Fortune 500 companies are using chat GPT. Now let's be precise. What he says is that they have do accounts with domain names with the company. So it kind of makes it look like chat GPT, like if your company is in the 8%, you're missing out. No, it could be two people in your company have used your company email address for their chat GPT account. But still, it's being used and you need to be aware of who's using it and why. And there are other products like Elon Musk has bought out Grok. You've got Anthropic, Bard. And if you haven't looked at Gemini that Google put out, uh, they announced it a couple of days ago, it's going to blow your mind. So this is stuff that you should learn to play with before you start using it for work stuff. And then an API, what is an API? Why is this important? I'm not trying to make you be technical, but you will see in the terms of service when they talk about API. And a little bit later, I'm gonna to talk to you about how the indemnification for open AI is different if you're dealing with the API versus if you're not, which is why I want you to understand this term. So think about this as the API is what helps your software connect to and commu to communicate with other systems. That's all you need to know for now. It takes requests from one people, imagine it's like the waiter and it goes back to the kitchen and tells everybody how to work together. That's probably the simplest Sesame Street version you can get of that. And just AI in general, there actually is no definition of AI. And AI has been around for since the 50s. What we're talking about here is generative AI because that's what really exploded into public consciousness last November. So here's our first poll question, so I can get an idea of who you are. And Dory, I think you're gonna drop the poll question. I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds to do it.
All right, Dory, if you're able okay. to share the results of that. All right, so 34% of you never use it. Good. Right, and only 11% of integrating into your business. Interesting. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So I will close the poll. So you're already using it. For those who say I've never used it, if you drive a Tesla, if you use Grammarly, if you use Siri, if you fall and you can't get up, you're already using it. Your doctors are using it. Everybody's using it. If you sit there and use a, do a Google search and it starts filling sentences for you, you're already using it, but you may not realize it. That's not such a big deal for your business perspective, but you need to think about who's using it in your company. Next question is how large is your department and, or your firm? This is important because I'm gonna ask you guys to do a lot of things and it might all fall on you. So it's, I'm just gonna get an idea of, of how big this is. And this should take very little time. So I think we could probably stop this poll right now. Okay, so a quarter of you, you are the firm. All right, so when I say get a task force together, that might be you and that's okay. I've been, it's always helpful for me to kind of get an idea of this stuff. And hopefully um, Mike and Dory are keeping track of these statistics as well. Next one, I feel like I already know the answer to this question. And if you could put the poll up. And please be honest. There is no shame here. All right, let's close this poll out because you either know the answer or you don't. <laughs> so. All right. You have no idea, 40, okay. That's what I thought. Okay, so the, the first two, all right. And then somebody has, a, some. Oh, who are these? Oh, 21 of you guys have a policy with detailed parameters that you monitor. I'm very impressed. All right, so, so and I'm, I'm sure you're being honest. Okay, great job. So let's give you a perspective of where you are. And I always found that if I had to go in and ask for money at budget time or to do something, it was always helpful to know who else is doing this. So McKinsey did a study and they found that 21% have established some kind of AI policy, right? Littler Mendelssohn, which is a large firm that does employment law, they, they, they searched maybe 400, but 96% of the of companies were US-based. So that's important because I know we have a lot of, of foreign uh, lawyers on the phone or on the, on the call. 37% have policies. Now, again, by definition, the people that hire Littler might be larger companies. So we should take that with a grain of salt. I asked ChatGPT about the use cases in business because this is important. A lot of lawyers don't realize who's using it. Your marketing people are probably using it for targeted campaigns and branding. Finance does risk models. Healthcare is exploding. If it's any place where healthcare is, where AI is being used, it's definitely in the healthcare area. Developing disease outcomes and predictions. Retails for supply chain. And not just retail, everybody's supply chain. The CEO of Maersk came out and talked about how much they're using um, AI to optimize their supply chains. Insurance companies are using it to look at fraud risk. So there's so many different areas. And you'll have these slides, so I'm not gonna show you all these, but I asked ChatGPT, how are businesses using a generative AI today? And these are the models that they came up with. Number one thing about, think about risk mitigation. This is where you find the insurance companies and others specifically looking at, at risk modeling. And then what are the risks in that? Gartner did a, a study uh, in uh, two months ago. And this is what they came out with. See where we are in legal? 3%. But your IT people, your customer facing function. So these are the people that lawyers advise, whether you're in-house counsel or outside counsel. So you need to see this is where the investment is going into AI usage. So here's one of the things I think you should do. And after each little section, I'm going to do a what to do next. So for the quarter of you that are the law department, hopefully you're not also IT, HR, internal audit, marketing, compliance, safety, and government relations, or you may not have all of that, right? If you're outside counsel, this is something you can set desk. And if you're in-house counsel, just do the best that you can. Which, when I wanted to start a, a task force, I became the privacy person because there was no one who wanted to do it. And that might happen with you. But the goal is to be able to ask questions because as lawyers in a silo, especially since many of us don't use it yet for our work, we need to know who else is doing it. So what are they using it for? 
And think about, do you have an approvals and controls policy? And what I mean by that is many companies have, if you're in-house counsel or outside counsel, you should know many companies will have something saying, you don't have to bring it to legal unless the contract is over $10,000, or you don't have to do this unless X, or we can bring in this vendor on if we have three, these three approvals. Go back and look at that, because what you're probably going to find is that those departments that are using um, generative AI processes might be getting additional things from vendors they're already using, so they may not have to come to you. So think about how might you think about who has to approve what, and find out are people in your company using it for personal use, but on company servers? Because that could also impose some risks. And then are you using AI? So for example, AI is often used in chatbots. Does your company use chatbots to ask people questions? One of the things that could come up, and we'll talk about this in a little while with the marketers, is that if your chatbots are performing better and you're getting much better data, that might mean they're collecting data that you haven't told your customers is going to be collected. So these are all things to think about. And the FTC is really cracking down on this. So in the United States, I know we have some foreign lawyers are on. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is really cracking down on this because you might be at risk at a false advertising or unfair deceptive trade practices that claim, including under state law, right? So these are other things to think about. And OpenAI and others have been sued about their use of AI and what they're telling consumers and customers. You'll get these slides so you can see, but these are some of the risks that the FTC sent this out to businesses. And the FTC has fantastic resources for businesses of all sizes. So I suggest that you go and take a look. Even if you're not in the United States, you can still see something that's helpful there. Up to stop here, Mike, are there any questions that we think, I don't see in the Q and the, in the Q and A. No, and you know, again, just as there, a reminder, yeah, I'm going to ask the group to just make sure we're now getting into the meat uh, that it's going to prompt a bunch of questions. You use the Q&A, not the chat, to ask questions that you want to surface for Marcia and for me. Uh, we'll use those both in this conversation and into the future. So please use the Q&A and thumb up when people ask good questions. So the first big risk is data privacy and cybersecurity. Right. And this is something that if you are that department of one, you're probably you may outsource a lot of things. But this is really, really important. And where people are particularly concerned about risk when it comes to AI is in this area. Now, you might say, I'm the contract lawyer. What do I why do I care? What I really want you to do is go back and look at the terms of service for everything. So, for example, we're on a Zoom webinar. A lot of people worried about in the early days of the pandemic, when everybody came by to Zoom, they were concerned that, wait a minute, maybe my stuff isn't secure. We can, people can Zoom bomb in, et cetera. What people didn't know is that Zoom was uh, in the process of working on keeping the data, the transcripts, the questions, the chats, and the images to train its own automated system. So if you go on Zoom right now, you'll see they've got the little automated system that you can add. It's because they were training. When people started finding out about this, especially lawyers, they said, wait a minute, you can't do that. So as of August, Zoom has changed to say, we don't use your audio, your video, your, that kind of stuff. But that wasn't necessarily the case because there was talk and I don't know if they actually ever did it. Same thing with Otter. I use something called Fireflies. They don't use the data. Did you put confidential data in there? Did you have confidential calls? I would still say no, um, but you want to be careful. Check your terms of service for anything that you're using that's transcribing or putting together transcripts or summarizing your data. Let's think about this when we talk about data. First question you want to think about is, do you know where your data is, right? And why is this important? You're like, wait a minute, I thought this was about AI. Because everything is exponentially more dangerous from a cybersecurity and a risk and data privacy perspective because of AI. So you should be thinking about data mapping. What does that mean? Imagine you have a house, right? And every single room of your house has different stuff in it. You might have this room, which has the sensitive employee data, this room, which has the uh, customer data, this room, which has your infrastructure, this room, which has your trade secrets. You need to know where everything is and how it connects, right? Because if you don't do that, when there is an issue from an AI perspective, you won't be able to deal with the regulators. You have a document retention destruction program. Everybody hates this. I've hated it. I've done it for years. And in different parts of the world, data means different things, right? But if you don't know where your data is, Again, when there is a breach or an issue, you're not going to be able to comply. Um, could you delete personal data? So for those of you that are in Europe or in Canada or other places where you know that the rights to privacy and, and keeping your data private are much stronger other than California than they are in the rest of the United States, could your company delete personal data? 
Have you done a data privacy impact assessment? What was that? Think about that like due diligence, just like you would need to know how the clauses relate to each other, what the risks are. That's the data privacy impact assessment. And do you know if your data is being scraped? Again, is your data training any of the tools that you're using? Because again, I guarantee you that you do not know all of the different vendors that you have that are using AI to do things for you. You know what privacy laws apply to your business? And I, I saw the Canadians, I know I didn't put Pipita on there. I know it's a law and it's been changing, right? So the Canadian privacy laws as well. There's all these different laws and so many more. Do you know if your vendors are data processors and what does that mean? And I'm talking about the smallest vendors that you have, every vendor you need to know. So here are some questions to ask your vendor or what to look at in contracts that relate to your customer, customer data. Is the vendor using privacy by design? You might wanna look or ask your vendor specifically, have you looked at the NIST frameworks that came out in January, 2023? That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Do you have any certifications such as ISO 27001? Right. These are questions and if your vendor doesn't know the answer to these questions, that in itself is a problem. And you may see it in contracts, or perhaps if you're amending your contracts, you might wanna put in the standards. So don't just say, we'd like you to use commercially reasonable efforts. You can actually put this language in. Is your data being anonymized or depersonalized? There's a difference. So these are the terms you wanna make sure you're looking for, right? With depersonalized, I'm just saying, okay, I know that Mike Whalen is a Kansas City fan, picking out the, the identifier of Kansas City, but that's different than being anonymous. So you wanna make sure you understand the difference between those terms, because again, you may fall, run afoul of various laws because of what your vendors are doing. Think about whether your vendors have the legal authority to process this information, especially if you're dealing with minors, and what are the data they're using. Some of you might be familiar with SOC 2, right, which is a third-party audit process. Now is the time to think about asking for that SOC 2 um, certification. Do they have that? Or if you're looking through contracts and you see it there, that should give you some level of comfort. But ask for that report. Ask about their data retention processes and what's their breach protocol. If there is a breach, because again, they've used other kinds of, of programs, when do they have to tell you? And if the word says promptly in your contracts, you want to change that, especially if you've got some kind of rules where you've got to inform regulators or others within 72 hours of those kinds of things. So now you might say, wow, there's a lot that I don't know about these vendors. Let me do this myself. So maybe you're thinking about your firm or your company should develop your own LLM or large language model. What might the risks be? And in fact, there was a report that found that accuracy, people are more worried about the accuracy. They're not so worried about the privacy, they're worried about the accuracy. Because 82% of people surveyed by Thomson Reuters said, yeah, we think we can use generative AI for our legal work. And if you look by country, it's relatively similar. Our Canadians, you guys are higher than anybody else, right? You guys have a lot more faith. But just because lawyers think it should be used, right now only 51% say it should be applied. And again, I warn you that we will be left behind if the, all the other departments, if we don't look at it. Here are some of the reasons. Large insurance brokers are saying, I don't think it's fit for practice because of accuracy, confidentiality, and what you may have heard of, the hallucinations. AI can make things up, right? So I've used AI to draft a contract. I said, this is the contract I want. It was fantastic, except it left out four major clauses. That's not a hallucination. That's being incomplete. Hallucinations are like this, when you type in saying, give me three cases that Sotomayor did X, Y, and Z, or that Ginsburg did for this, and it gives you stuff that looks like this, and this is chat GPT, and every single thing here is wrong, but it looks really good. Or you could be like the poor attorney, and hopefully you're not on the phone uh, or on the webinar, who worldwide, uh, I was in Europe when this came out, and even they knew about this, where this poor attorney used chat GPT to write a brief, um, and the cases were not correct. Now, by the way, the attorney said, it to ChatGPT, I want to make sure they're correct. And ChatGPT said, yes, they are correct. So asking more than once didn't get the correct answer, got fined $5,000 and lawyers far and wide know the story. That's why a lot of firms are using things that are now specifically made like co-counsel or firms that are putting things together. I heard a, a partner from DLA Piper actually, because they're building their own large language model. I heard him say on a podcast a few days ago that doing a deposition, he put the complaint into ChatGPT, and I'm not worried about that because the complaint is a public document, and said, help me come up with some deposition questions for the CEO. And it came up with like 150 deposition questions, which were excellent. 
So the world is going to change. So we need to know about them. But these are companies that are using um, likely OpenAI or something else to build their own. But what's the problem that could come in? And this is what you want to ask your, your, your people building your systems or your internal IT or outsource IT. How do you deal with prompt injection attacks? Right now you have cybersecurity training, right? And you know about phishing and spear phishing and that kind of stuff. This is another area. And a prompt is when you type into your, your program, tell me the five, the, the five biggest business risks in running a company like Law Insider so that you can develop your clauses or whatever it is. But there are now ways that hacker goes into the AI system and put a carefully prompted uh, word, set of words to trick it to ignoring the rules. Actually, they found out Google did this with chat with ChatGPT. They put in the word poem, like if it's poem forever, and it started spitting out open AI secret source code. So you want to be careful about this. Indirect attack is a slightly different thing, but talk to your IT people, your in-house or your outside providers about how they are dealing and protecting against this. You might also have heard of deep fakes. Some of you may have heard the song between Drake and The Weeknd, and it sounded real. Everybody loved it. The streaming companies got freaked out because it wasn't their real song. Because right now, deep fakes can be used. AI programs can listen to three seconds of your voice and replicate it. What if it's your CEO? What if it's something else? And deep fakes and other things can be much more dangerous, which is beyond the scope of this. But ask your vendors or ask your IT people, how are we preventing from this kind of thing coming out? Because I guarantee you, your leaders have said some public statement somewhere and people can clone the voice. Now let's think about your cyber insurance policy and disclosures, right? Cybersecurity used to just mean, let's make sure we download the patch so we don't get a zero day attack or those kinds of things. It's much more complicated than this now. So you wanna look and look at your cyber policy if you have one and see, does it address AI related risk, right? What if there's unlawful data usage? Because I've heard a lot of insurance companies saying, well, if they don't have the appropriate safeguards from an AI perspective, we're going to exclude them from coverage. And if you are a public company or a company that has to worry about the new SEC cybersecurity disclosure rules, those come into effect next week. And so you really wanna make sure that you are prepared. Um, and is this additional risk factor that you have to worry about? So here's some things you should do. You wanna look at your vendors and, and your, your contracts to see how can we minimize the collection and processing of personal data. Every state law and every country law has its own definition of what personally identifiable information is. So think about what are the safeguards that your contracts have to protect these kinds of issues? How is the data collected? And look at your own terms of service and your own privacy clauses on your own website. Do you use generative AI for the processing of customer, client, or employee data? And do you now need to change what's on your terms of service and your privacy policies to accommodate that? You want to make it clear, especially if you put together some kind of policy about looking at the privacy settings and all the AI tools, if it's on your phone, if it's on your computer, so that you're not training it, especially with that company data. Think about preventing the browser add-ons and check with their outside counsel guideline and see if they have AI restrictions as well. Um, so with that, you should also think about um, a vendor risk assessment. You should enhance your cybersecurity training. And if your company is not already doing tabletop exercises, this is you know where you have, basically you'll have a red team and a blue team and you're looking for all these vulnerabilities. You want to do that and talk to your IT people about doing one specifically looking for AI vulnerabilities. And again, check your cyber insurance um, for any kind of AI clauses or exclusions. So before I go on to the next area, I wanna see if there's any questions. Can I clarify the executive order in terms of startups having no privacy for AI intellectual property? Um, I cannot answer the question about whether it's a constitutional violation. Um, I think that is really an important issue. And the executive order, you know, I think it's, it was good that it came out. Uh, the problem for some of you guys that don't know, there was, you know, it's over a hundred pages, mainly deals with what government entities are supposed to do. Um, there were some questions about whether it applied to smaller companies because a lot of the smaller companies were very worried because the big companies kind of put in information into there about what they thought should be there. But I can't say what about, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I have my thoughts. I do think that they are, and I, I do talk to a lot of people who are involved in some of this area in DC and other places, that there, I think there could be some amendments or some other things because 
again, and there was a New York Times article yesterday about governments are scrambling to try to figure out how to make this work. That's part of the reason that I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the EU AI Act, by the way, which everybody thought was a done deal that was supposed to be future proof. Um, but it really isn't. And you have a whole cabal of other companies in the EU, like Italy and France and others saying, we think we want to do something different. So that's why I said going through the laws was probably not going to be the best use of time because they are in flux. So I hope that that's okay. There's another question about um, the ivory risk we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Some of you guys might not be employment lawyers. Many of you probably aren't, but every company has employees, right? So here's what I want you to think about. And here's where you're basically going to probably ask other people, unless you are the only lawyer in your department and you have to deal with this, this is where you ask other people some of these issues. First of all, the biggest concern from an AI perspective is bias, job, credit applications when it comes to these issues about race, gender, age, et cetera. Because some AI systems, so maybe your company uses AI right now to determine whether somebody is credit worthy. There are many AI programs, and this is what you want to check to see with that vendor. What are they doing to minimize bias? Because there are some that will look for look at your job history and, and even without knowing your name, or some that will look at resumes and say, okay, that person, based on what this thing is, this person is a female, this person is black, and will automatically screen people out. That's one of the biggest concerns that you see with AI. SHRM, which is a Society of Human Resource Management, a, a U.S. organization, right? They did a survey. And by the way, worldwide, it's 68% that use it for recruiting and hiring. But AI is already being used in so many human resources processes. But this is becoming a problem. The EEOC, which in the United States is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which looks at all our labor laws, um, says that it can do much worse harm than any HR professional in terms of discrimination. But if it's used properly, it can actually be a benefit. So you've had companies that are using AI as a screener, and one company had to pay $365,000 because it screened out 200 people based on age, because that was the selection bias. By the way, when you're training it internally, you're training it on your own information. So if your information is biased, let's say you say you're gonna build your own large language model or a small language model. If the information already has bias in it, you're just gonna perpetuate that problem. Skin color issues, the 100 times, AI systems are 100 times more likely to be failed if you're a black, brown, or Asian. This is important because you might be, if you've got a facial recognition program, this could be causing problems. Some companies are using automated systems because they're having Zoom calls. They don't necessarily tell the participant that they're actually reading the expressions on their face using AI. This is a problem. This is one of the things that the EU would have a problem with, by the way. So what does the EEOC say? You can use AI, but make sure that your screening tools, and this is what I want you to ask your vendors and ask your HR people, Make sure the screening tools are taking out things like name, because if you see my name, Marcia, you might think it's Marcia. Either way, it's typically a female name, right? Um, that should say sex, um, age, national origin. The EOC says, by the way, think about using bots, because bots won't hear an accent. Human beings will hear an accent and will screen people out. There are new laws and automated decision makings where the AI is making the decisions, and that is now going to be illegal in many places. The Americans with Disabilities Act, and every country has their own issues about disability as well, says, think about, are you using AI systems to do assessments? Um, you've got to have another alternative. Your AI can't exclude people. Um, and that's where I see a lot of low-hanging fruit coming here. So what should you do? Ask your HR and talent management people, how are you screening people? And then go back to those vendor contracts to look for AI implications. Remember, my rule of thumb is things are getting better and faster. Chances are there's more AI being used that your vendor hasn't told you about. Um, and because it speeds up efficiency, what's AI really good at? Patterns, large patterns of information, right? But be careful because now you're spending companies where their background checks are, they're finding even more violations of Title VII, which deals with, you know, race, gender, religious, et cetera, and FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So you need to go back and look at your vendors and say, what are you doing? And I know in some of the countries there are people listening, you can't even do a background check. But for those where you can, you want to think about this. New York City, Illinois, California, Maryland, and several other countries have now passed rules about automated decision-making processes using AI. And in fact, in New York City, you'll now have to do a third-party audit of your technology platform that you use for hiring and promotion and put those audit findings on your website. So if you are operating in these jurisdictions, you want to be particularly careful. SHRM, 
This is what they say you should ask. And again, you're going to get these slides. Talk about statistical analysis. Um, why do they ask about diversity consultants when using the tools? Because they want to make sure that you're getting rid of that algorithmic bias that is causing many companies to have issues. And what kind of alternative formats are people being able to use in terms of your hiring processes? Now think about putting together policies. I know a few of you guys have policies already and hopefully you guys can connect with each other and tell them how to do them. But here's the questions you should ask. Should your employee be able to have ChatGPT or any generative AI on their personal devices? And if so, practically speaking, how are you gonna audit this? Just like some companies said, don't no TikTok on your phone because we're concerned about you know, Chinese government you know, gathering company information. But how would you actually do it? Which employees can and cannot use it? The policy needs to be very, very clear. Who can approve, who can use it, and why? Um, because if you just say employees cannot use this, no one is going to follow that. It's really important to figure out what's confidential and what's not. If you're a law firm, you know that you have your little footer that says everything is confidential, even meet me at the cafeteria for lunch. That's not confidential. But your employees need to understand because when we say don't put confidential information into the generative AI uh, platform, confidential could be the eye of the beholder. And what types of work can they do? There might be, yeah, we can use it to draft and review contracts, but we can't use it for this. And then have some kind of electronic or other attestation about the policy and the training. Most importantly, have a human being. So you can use, think about using generative AI as your first draft, but a human being has to double check it at the end, right? Whether that's citations for a brief or whether that's in the contract. And then the most important thing, have that non-lawyer look at this. Find the employee that's always finding the loopholes and everything. Often this is the employee that complains about how everything should be done. Those are the people that will find every loophole. Whenever I do a risk assessment, I go to the employee that's always complaining and they'll always tell me, well, if you did this, this, and this, because we are law-abiding people. By definition, we're lawyers. It is very hard for us to think about the loopholes that will come out. So the number one thing for any policy, ask somebody to find, here's all the ways that we could get around this. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about intellectual property um, in a second. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I'm going to get some of those. I'm going to get to a little bit later. So I am not an IP expert. I know just enough to be dangerous. So if you are an IP expert, feel free to tell me that I'm wrong in the chat, but this is going to be the shortest section because, by the way, there's a lot out there on IP and AI, and this area is changing by the minute. What I want you to think about is what is your marketing team doing? Or if you are the marketing person, what are you doing? Basic, and this is a, sorry for our, our international people, this is a US centric list of, of copyright issues, right? So copyright covers these kinds of areas. For those of you that remember the, the screen actors, the, the actor site strike and the writer strike, a lot of it was because of the thought that the studios were going to use AI replicas of the voice and the image of the likeness of, of actors whether they're extras or others, and that's what kept it out for so long. So now there's a process where if they do that, there's gonna be some compensation, but this was the issue, right? So there's a thing that's called the right of publicity. If you got early on, uh, earlier in the year, people would go on to things like mid-journey stable diffusion. I'll show you what those look like in a minute. And marketers especially would sit there and say, I would like you to imagine you are a world-class podcaster video person like Mike Whalen. I would like you to write this script in the voice of Mike Whalen and do X. Or imagine you are an artist like Van Gogh. In the style of Van Gogh, do X. I used to go to trainings, I would hear that all the time. And then you saw a flood of lawsuits come in. They don't succeed as much. Sarah Silverman just su uh, suffered some kind of defeat in court recently, but Getty Images has sued OpenAI. There's lots of areas. So think about what's the training that your marketers need to have to think about whether they're doing the right thing. These are some of the, the areas. Now it's DALI 3 by this time, Mid-Journey Stable Diffusion, so many others. These don't really look very realistic, but you can do very realistic things. You can do very realistic things and have the deep fake. You could have a picture of your CEO and his voice telling employees X, Y, Z, or going, or somebody else could create um, an image of your CEO, go to a company like Eleven Labs, make a video, where, and they go out on Twitter and make a pronouncement spilling all kinds of company trade secrets. These are really deep things which are beyond the scope of this course, uh, of this webinar, but the deep fake issue is one of the biggest concerns because, and again, I, these none of these are photorealistic, 
but I have used photorealistic images um, in other presentations of, of ex-President Trump of, and of, of Joe Biden, and that can be very dangerous. I don't have a solution to that, by the way. So I know there's a question, what should we do? I don't know. You just need to be aware, you just need to be aware of it. And some of you may have seen this beautiful piece of art won all kinds of worldwide competitions, no copyright protection. The Copyright Office just had a, an open for comment. It closed last month because this is the big concern. There's no copyright protection because AI was used and the Copyright Office, Patent Office was the same thing. No human involvement, right? Just typing in, create a beautiful picture of such and such. Not going to get copyright protection. So what does this mean? Maybe your marketing team is coming up with fantastic new images for the website. You want to save money, times are tough. So we're going to get rid of 80% of the marketing team and we're going to rely on generative AI. And I've heard a lot of companies doing this right now. You need to ask them what the tools are and what the terms of service are, what the indemnification is and whether they need to attribute sources because they may be themselves infringing on other, especially if they use the old style of give me something in the style of suck and fetch. Right? And again, that area is in flux. I think this is probably something that the Supreme Court's going to have to decide about this. Um, but until that happens, they want to be very careful. What about our customer service chatbot? What does that mean in terms of risk? Right? Now, what are the company assets that they're using, the marketing team, to generate the content? It might be biased itself. It might start spitting things out. And the most important thing is if the marketing team is using generative AI to create content, whether that's you know, redo your website, or do, you know, do your new logo. There is no IP protection for that, right? So you should be comfortable that the assets that your marketing group prepares for your company could end up on the side of a bus or in somebody else's ad campaign um, if they are using generative AI. Now, I think what you're going to see come out of the copyright office at some point, probably relatively soon, is, is there a percentage of okay, 80% human involvement and 20% AI? But right now, we don't have that. So this is something to be careful about. And then you want to make sure that they're checking for factual errors, bias, and IP infringement before publicizing anything. So remember, I talked about that approvals and control. Does your marketing people need do your marketing people need to run things through you? Do they need to do some kind of checkoff? Something like that might need to come and play. So you're going to be the most popular person in your company if you go back and start asking all these people questions. Um, let me see if there's um, Michael. Are there any questions you think I should answer? Not yet. Uh, but if you all have okay. any questions, please do add them to the Q&A. So the question about protecting the source codes, this is going to be a case by case. And this is where I would talk to your IT people because that's something they're going to know better. But this is where you need to look at the terms of service. And, and I'm going to talk to you about indemnification some terms of service right here. Right. So you all know what indemnification is. I want you to think about two things, the enterprise versus regular people. Okay, I do not have an enterprise version of ChatGPT. Now, Sam Altman said during the development conference that it was 92 people. Chat GP, uh, the ChatGPT website says 80%. So either 92 or 80% of Fortune 5 companies have registered ChatGPT accounts. So here's what they tell enterprise people. You own and control your business data. We do not train on your business data. We don't learn from your usage. We're also SOC 2 compliant. Remember I told you to look for that in your contract. And all conversations are encrypted in transit and at rest. And if you know anything about privacy, you're like, good, right? This is what you want to see. This is what you want to see in most of your vendor contracts. So if you haven't looked at your vendor contracts recently, you want to look at them for this. And for indemnification, they'll indemnify you because of any infringement on third-party intellectual property rights. Right, unless you do all these other things. Of course, they have their little limitations. But if from an enterprise perspective, you are much more protected, they'll even procure at their own expense the right for you to continue to use their services. This is fantastic. So if you, even if you don't have enterprise, I encourage you to go look at the enterprise indemnification on OpenAI because it has what I think is some pretty good protective language. Now, if it's just Marcia, I basically agree to indemnify, hold them harmless, et cetera. Regardless, there's no protection. They won't indemnify me at all. This is why in your audit, I said, I want you to go back and see who is using chat GPT either on your servers and their personal account or who's using it personally, not on your servers, but are putting you company information into them. Because 
there's not going to be any protection at all. So for regular users, I showed you the enterprise, what they say. For regular users, they, we don't actively seek out your personal information. And we work to reduce the amount and we'll try to minimize the possibility. So basically very lawyerly, like squirrely language to basically say, you really don't have a whole lot of protection. That's why the audit of who's using, whether it's ChatGPT, Claude, any of the others is so important because your protections will be very, very different. So if you look at it, this is what, as of last week, what OpenAI said for regular people. This is why I said you have to know the word API. Your enterprises are API consumers. You, a regular person, is a non-API consumer. We might use your data to improve our model. We might retain certain data for your interactions, but we'll take steps to reduce it, we'll try. So number one thing I would do after you finish this webinar is to go and find out who's using it, why, and do you have an enterprise? Because when you're doing your policy, you need to be able to be aware of this. Um, and again, indemnification, you'll indemnify, hold harmless. And by the way, a limitation of liability, if you have any kind of issue, our aggregate liability is $100 or what you paid over the past few months, not a lot. So think about not just for um, OpenAI, but any vendor for your indemnification. What do you need? Who's going to get included? Are you including your affiliates, contractors, and third party? So when you're doing that, remember your indemnification might be different than who's in your preamble. So for every contract, you're going to have a preamble. The people in there might be different than the people who get included for your indemnification. So this is where you definitely don't want to just do a cutting and pasting. And Law Insider has whole lots of clauses that you can look at for indemnification You know that, that'll help you whether you're indemnity for the indemnity. Think about whether it should be mutual or unilateral and what kind of caps you're going to have in place, right? You might have caps and baskets. The basket would sit there and say, we're not going to indemnify until you reach $100,000, right? That's how you mitigate, right? Your cap might say, we're not going to indemnify anything over a million dollars. So it's 100,000 is your basket and a million is your, is your cap. You might think of what's called a super cap. And if that's a term you're not familiar with, the super cap is something that you are, which is going to be much bigger than your general caps, right? Maybe this is failure to comply with certain kinds of laws, fraud. Often you'll see this in the data breach area. Um, and then of course, what's your dispute resolution and how is that going to work? Let me check here and then I'm gonna to go to ethical issues and then we'll go to look at some more Q and A. Um, before I do that, okay, in a company which design for use on consumer products is a factor, where would mine look to see a policy for use? So, this is where you'd probably have to create policies. Where I think the problem is, is most companies don't have a policy that's going to address a lot of these issues, right? And that's why I'm suggesting that you get that cross-functional team together um, or work with your outside counsel, and also that you're really clear about what makes sense for your company. If you are a Fortune 500 company, you're going to have a very different thing. If you're a company with 20 employees, right, you're going to have a very different look. And that's why I say have that other person the people, your employees, look at it first before you roll it out. Um, do you have any guidance on when the vendor will only indemnify in the training data, but not the output of the model? How will that risk application pay out? So it really depends on how much power you have, right? If you are the big dog and the vendor is a little dog and you provide a whole lot, then you can then you have more options. But often, if you're dealing with you know an Oracle, a Salesforce, some humongous company, there's very little you're going to be able to do in that negotiation. And that's why you have to sit there and think about What's the risk? So if they're gonna indemnify only on the training data, but not on the output of the model, part of the reason they do that is because they can't rely on what they use to train. So you've put some information in, but they're also getting information from everybody else. Now, if you mean the training data that you put in, because it is your own large language model, and I don't know if you wanna clarify that question. I think that comes from, no, I can't find it. James Wang. But who, okay. I know, James, if you want to clarify that a little bit more when you say the training data, I don't know if that means the data that you're putting in to train your own separate large language model or just the training data of the others. Okay. If op is OpenAI and ChatGPT using the data we provide when we use it, and if so, how can you limit this? I have, I have some how-tos on that. I think I have them in this presentation. If not, I'm just going to read them off another presentation because there's, uh, and some of the slides earlier that I skipped over will have that. So for example, I don't let it, you can go into settings. So go into OpenAI, um, and if you go, if you're using ChatGPT or any of them that you're using, 
go into privacy, security, terms of service, it'll tell you and it'll give you hyperlinks. So I have mine that it cannot train the data. I don't keep my chat history at all, which becomes very annoying because sometimes I won't go back and look at it, right? But I want to make it very clear. Even if you say, don't keep the chat history, I have to double check. The last time I looked, OpenAI said it would take, it could take them 30 days to, to get rid of it. So you want to look and see how much is in there. And that's why I suggest that you play around with it personally if you haven't done it um, for a business perspective. Um, but turn off the chat history, look at all your browser add-ons. Um, there's every day, there's a million new um, AI products coming out and lots of add-ons. Um, if you're using Word, there's an AI capability in there. Amazon has added AI capability. Snapchat added AI capability, which now they got sued by the um, a, a privacy commissioner in the EU because of, of the kinds of outputs that were going out. So again, at this point in the wild, wild west, we have to just go ahead and and uh, check the terms of service. But you're a contract lawyer, so this is easy for us. <laughs> right. And I want to end on some ethical issues, then I'll go back to some of the Q&A. So, we have, a, if you're in the United States, you have a duty of competence, right? So we actually have to learn how to understand these and understand how you're using generative AI. In certain states, I think I'm going to have to say, there's also an ethical duty of understanding technology. So if you say, right, this was an interesting academic exercise. Think about, you need to make it just like your professional reading time. I would spend some time every day getting up to speed and looking at how these things work because it's our ethical duty to do so. And then how to go how you could use it, right? At some point, it's gonna be malpractice not to use GAI in the future. Right now, it's not so great at math and mathematical equations, but it's getting there. That's gonna change the game in so many different areas because the, the computing processes and everything is gonna get so much better. If you know that you can have it do the first draft of a contract and then you go ahead and, um, and, and then sign it up, that's going to be much better for you. Um, I know a lot of lawyers are thinking, but this is going to take my whole job away. And I'll use the refrain that everybody says, it's not going to take your job away. Lawyers who understand how to use generative AI are going to take your job, but it's not going to all be done by that. And there's also a rule of diligence, right? Because you've got to keep those high professional standards. So think about whether if you're sending something out, do you want a disclaimer or a disclosure about whether AI was used in whole or in part? And you might want to ask about that as well. How are you supervising and training your staff and paralegals, right? In the United States, we've got responsibilities 5.1 and 5.3 about the professional standards because otherwise you're gonna be dealing with those fines and penalties. And then informed consent. You've gotta tell people that you're using AI, right? Because you can't just say, I never used it. I know I'm sounding much more brilliant than usual, but I don't use it. And these are the ethical rules again in the United States with 1.4, 1.6, communication and confidentiality. The reason I started off with data privacy and cybersecurity being the biggest risk is that it has con you know, considerable risks for us when it comes to our ethical duties to keep client data confidential. So you wanna make sure that you're outside counsel. If you are outside counsel, you need to make sure that you're talking about the use of generative AI. And if you are in-house counsel and have outside counsel, you wanna ask them directly, when do you use it? How do you use it? Where is my data? Is my client information anonymized? Are there data sets? If you can't prove to me your data sets are secure, I want to opt out. And do this with all the vendors that you can. So you really, when you do that vendor risk assessment, this is where you want to see, right? Maybe we use Iron Mountain for keeping our documents. We use this company for this. Now is the time to do that contract audit and see and ask those questions. If it's not in there, reach out to your representative for your vendor and tell us how you're using AI, right? And you want to check the terms of service and privacy of your own tools as well as theirs. And then for outside counsel, it's time for you to rethink billing, right? Because at some point, if you can spit out 160 deposition questions in 10 minutes with a generative AI, then I don't want to be charged for four hours for you for deposition questions of you know, development. Same thing with the contract, right? Yes, you want that human being to review it, but you know the ethical issue is, can you still bill by the hour for this? So if you're outside counsel, you got to think about your engagement letters and talk about what's in there and that you're anonymizing client information in your prompts. The ABA has a resolution because we're short on time. I'm going to skip that. And then think about your duty of competence. How do you stay up to date with these latest advancements? Rule 1.1 is confidence. In the United States, there's at least 25 states that have introduced artificial intelligence bills. 15 states in Puerto Rico have actually adapted. The EU legislation is, you know, if they're in their trilogue discussions to determine what it's actually going to look at. But make sure you're able to turn off your tools 
for users in problematic jurisdictions. You have to figure out how that would work with your vendors. Um, and then I have some resources here as well. Um, these are hyperlinks. So when you send the slides, I'll send it in a way that you can actually get onto the hyperlinks. Um, these are more US centric, uh, my apologies, but, uh, but you can also find something similar uh, in the other jurisdictions that you're in. So now I'm gonna stop the share I know that was a lot of information, and then we can maybe answer some questions. Marcy, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take a breath for a minute. Yeah, to close up, yeah. I, I just wanna share something exciting uh, with you all that Marcia is helping us with. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed with in-house counsel, reminds me of that moment in uh, Finding Nemo where they say to the dad, you're a clownfish, that means you're funny, right? People go up to in-house lawyers and like, hey, you're the lawyer person, right? That means you know all the law stuff. Uh, and that can be incredibly overwhelming. Uh, what we're doing with Marcia is creating what we're calling the in-house orientation. And the idea is that when you go into a lot of these roles, you can see from what Marcia is talking about just with AI, you're playing a hide and seek game, right? Uh, I, one of the things that I've learned is that contracts have a lot more information than they th than you think they do, but they have a lot less than you need. And so Marcia and, and we are creating a course together. It's a robust course. I mean, this is multiple modules with video and workbooks. Uh, and we're going to have a wait list for it. And so I'm going to ask you all to do me a favor. Go over to uh, the wait list. If you go to lawinsider.com slash in-house orientation, you can get on the wait list. There's no obligation to buy anything uh, if you sign up for this. We, we are just trying to give you information. If it is useful to you to think about orienting yourself and learning these hide and seek skills uh, that Marcia is talking about, knowing which documents to look at right away, which things to put off for a little while, who in the company to talk to, what questions to ask them. That's what we're trying to model. So please go over to lawinsider.com slash in-house orientation and get on that wait list. The last thing we'll do, Marcia, is give you a minute to see if there are any other questions that you're interested in. But a reminder to everyone, we're going to be sending these slides uh, and this recording out to everyone who registered. So please, if you have other questions, just email us back at community at lawinsider.com and make sure that you go get on that in-house orientation registration uh, or uh, wait list page. Uh, Marcia, did anything else before we close stand out to you? Um, not necessarily, but what I think I'm gonna do, I saw some that I wanna be able to ask for, that I wanna be able to look into more. And I've also saved the chat. So if any of you put some questions in the chat, so what I commit to doing is um, I will, also add some more resources to the, those links because those uh, links, the hyperlinks at the end, I did that two weeks ago and I have even more hyperlinks that I want to add for you. So um, I'm happy to add more. You can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you see questions that if you didn't have a chance to put them in the chat, but you went back and talked to somebody, um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Marcia and Ryan Weld on LinkedIn. You can find me. And then I'll work with Mike and Law Insider and put together a kind of a compilation of the questions. I would answer more, but I was running a fever last night and I'm really kind of, kind of it's hard to talk right now. And uh, and I wanna make sure that I can really give a fulsome answer to your questions. All right, well, Marcy, I'm gonna say thank you. That was a great presentation. Again, we'll send it out. Y'all email me at mike at lawinsider.com if you have any questions. Thank you. I, I hope all of you will do me a favor, go over to LinkedIn and just publicly thank Marcia for joining us and training us and teaching us. That's really helpful. Uh, tag Marcia, tag me, tag Law Insider. Just let the world see that uh, that Marcia was uh, I'll able to help us show and, this and, again. and increase that, uh, yeah, increase that profile for Marcia. It's really helpful. Just search her, look no, her up. Thank you don't her need publicly. to increase my profile. <laughs> it's not no, about no, me. Big deal. It's okay. about getting you All guys right. the information. She's a big, she's um, a big deal. We're going to make her a bigger deal. Uh, Marcia, thank you again. Uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks all. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.